Well, hello everyone. Today is a bit of a different day, minus the fact that it's uh, late Wednesday when I'm finishing this. I do not have Joel, Doris, or Jessica, or Hugo, or Amabel with me. Well, not that they're not with me, like they're with me in an abstract sense. At least, at least my wife and my children, they're, excuse me, they're upstairs, but Joel and Doris are away for today. And uh, since the kids are away, it's time to play, so to speak. Well, we are going to be diving into this Romans Bible study. Romans 11, 32 is the verse I have up there. Had it up there for a while. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. We're going to deal with this verse this week. And then we're going to move on from Romans. This is the last time we're going to be dealing with Romans. Uh, we're going to move on to another book. I am unsure quite what direction we're going to go. But so far we're going to finish off with everything St. Paul says in Romans about uh, the last days. And last week we spoke of the narrative of scripture specifically. We talked about how there's one God and one bride and how the one bride is made up of many uh, persons. We left that mystery for this week, but we specifically focused on last week the destiny of the one man, how the church is united in Jesus Christ and the life that Jesus lives is the life we're going to live and that's the promise of heaven. That's what it's all about. And so we find that Jesus is the key to knowledge, as he's called in the gospel, according to St. Luke, uh, chapter 11, verse 52. He's the key to knowledge. He unlocks the mysteries of scripture for us. And that was really where we left that off. Heaven is the promise of life with God forever for God's people, the life that Jesus has as the son of God, who's with God forever, right? Though there are many Christians, there is one church. That's the mystery we're dealing with today. But as always, we don't want to forget that this whole narrative of God saving humanity is at the back of Paul's mind. He has eternity on his mind, so to speak. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's what we talked about last week. And there's a part in there, which we're going to talk about this week, which is the whoever believes in him or the church. Whoever believes in him is one group made up of many individuals, and that's the church. It's many persons, but one church. Paul's going to talk about the pathway of the church through world history, through salvation history, in his epistle to the Romans, specifically. And we're going to look at some final things he has to say on the signs of the end times and things like that, so to speak. In Romans, though, we can never forget this kind of key principle that orients uh, what he's doing and what he's working with. Now, he's dealing with many things, but one of the big ones he deals with is the primacy of the Jews while the church remains one in Christ. He spends a lot of time, the first like 11 chapters really, dealing with the mystery of how the church comes into existence and what it means for the church to really be the church. And he starts with the Jews, then the Gentiles, how we join into one body. That's really the majority of what the letter is about. And that's from the outset. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, this verse, because uh, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, sorry, the righteous will live by faith. Uh, faith from first to last is in other translations from faith to faith means the same thing. What he's talking about in this verse is really setting the program of what he's going to be talking about for most of the book, which is the distinctions of how the church came into being, right? How it is Jews and now it's Jews and Gentiles and what it means for us and all these things and how we are one people under this one great promise of salvation. If we want to paraphrase this verse, we can paraphrase it as follows. The gospel is equally for everyone, but there is an order in history. And since we are all one, the method of salvation is the same for everyone. In general, that's kind of the concept of the book of Romans. And this is really, to, to say it again, the direction he goes. We'll take one example to maybe demonstrate this. Uh, specifically, that salvation comes to all people who believe, all people. And he specifically is dealing with Jews and Gentiles. In other words, all the people of the world. He notes that all people, Jews and Greeks, or Jews and Gentiles, 
are under sin. That's what he establishes in Romans 1. He charges that all people are sinners, specifically Gentiles. And then he goes on in 2, Romans chapter 2, and talks about how the Jews are also sinners. And he then concludes in Romans 3, 9 that everyone is a sinner. And then after wrestling with this idea of sin and faith and all these things, he comes to the conclusion that salvation is not by the things that we do, but by the things he has done. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The we, meaning Jews and Gentiles, united together in one man, Jesus Christ, towards God, now reconciled. No longer is God's wrath revealed against ungodliness. I, I just remembered now that we haven't prayed yet. How about we pray before we continue? Father God, Lord, please be with us as we talk about your word. Illuminate it to us. Guide us, Lord, as we discuss it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul has spent the better part of these chapters, really, proving salvation by faith and by extension, establishing that we are all one in Christ. And this is where he springs for the rest of the book, from Romans 12, really, to the end. He talks about this mystery of being the church. So in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And this isn't a metaphorical statement. It's a statement of reality. Let's not forget that. So let's, let's bear in mind this lens, okay? Okay, now we see, we see, I think, hopefully, how salvation is for everyone, ties through the whole book of Romans in the brief little slew of verses. Let's remember this. And let's, let's pay attention to Paul's discussion on Abraham. He's going to talk about this mystery about how the church is all one. And he's going to use Abraham as an example. How though we are not children of Abraham, we are in fact children of Abraham. And by we, I mean Gentiles who are, are not genetically descended from Abraham. We are connected to Abraham. Romans 4, 1 to 3. What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, Abraham, we remember him from the Old Testament. We did a study in his life. Abraham comes to faith in God, and there's a verse in Genesis where it says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul then takes this verse, and he continues. Is this blessedness? Only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? And the answer is it was not after, but before. In other words, God considered Abraham righteous before he officially became a Jew or someone who had the law, someone who was circumcised. God considered him righteous previously. And so Paul says, see, we Jews and Gentiles are no different from Abraham. Righteous not because of the things we do, but because of who we believe. That's, that's what he's pushing here. He continues to say, and he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he, meaning Abraham, is the father of all who believe, all of us, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. In what way is he our father? According to the promise. See that? Continuing on. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law, through circumcision or obeying commands, that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. So this long discussion from Romans chapter 4, hopefully you're able to follow along and I'm not moving too quickly. Essentially what it's saying is that Abraham believed and because he believed in God, he was saved. That's what saved him, his faith. And as proof of his faith, he had certain works or actions he had to do. Paul is saying that is no different from how we are saved. We believe in Jesus, and we prove our faith in Jesus through our works. But our works are not what saves us. 
So then, Paul concludes, Abraham and we worship the same God in the same way that we may look differently and be in different places of the timeline. Let's, let, let me enumerate that a bit more. Let's make some deductions, so to speak. Let's, let's take a peek. So Abraham is our father, not by genes, because most of us are not descended from him genetically, but by his role and placement in salvation history, i.e., he is the one for whom it is written, salvation comes by faith, and we are saved by faith, so he's our father, he's our predecessor in this way, and he is our predecessor in timeline. He believed in God before all of us alive were born, before everyone really who is alive right now was born. So that's, that's his role. And though he precedes us, he is still part of the church, for there is only one bride. We are all one body, Romans 12, 5, but with many members. Now, let me say, well, this seems, is this a consistent idea? Is it consistent that even the Jews, the Gentiles, are one people in God's eyes? That every Christian, regardless of timeline, placement in history, is one? Well, let's see. What does the Bible say about the Israelites? Let's see how the Lord talks about them. Does he talk about them in this way? That they are first in, in the timeline? They have a special role because of their order? Like how Abraham, he is our father. He has that special role, even though we are equal in Christ. Is it talked about in that way? Let's see. Exodus 4.22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Firstborn son in what sense? What does he mean? What does the Lord mean? First in role. Israel is the first that Christ has rescued. The first one that he's displayed his deliverance to. But also the first in salvation history. Israel is the firstborn son because apart from them, what Bible is there? Apart from their history, really who preserved God's words? Now, that's just a deduction from Exodus 4.22 and from these verses about Abraham. We're just applying them. We're using our minds. Does St. Paul perhaps have a comment on this particular thing I've just said, that the Jews have a special salvation history role? They're also first in a salvation timeline, and that's how God intends it. That's the order of things. We'll see what he says. Concerning order, that's in fact exactly what he says. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First, to the Jew. Then, to the Gentile. It's an order. A timeline order. A salvation history order. All right? It's not a first for, with no meaning. It is a first in timeline. And what is the role? What is the specific role? What is the hat, so to speak, that the Israelites wear? He deals with this directly. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God, with preserving God's word, with the Old Testament, with the law. God gave them a special place, a special role in salvation history. What does this mean? So the Jews and the Israelites are the first to have the revelation of God, and they have the greatest role. That's what St. Paul is saying. Now, does he get all of that from uh, Exodus 4.22? Well, in part, certainly we can say he gets it from the Old Testament, but he also gets it from Christ, this primacy of the Jews. What does Jesus say? John 4.22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. They have a special place. The genetic, the physical, the biological people of Israel. Though we are one church, the Jews have a special place due to the nature of the timeline, due to the nature of their role. Is it that God loves Jews more than he loves Gentiles? No. For we're one church. But it is that he has something special for them in their role. But we are one body of many members. So what if they are an eye and we are a finger or a toe or whatever? We are still one body. We just have many different roles, not just in an individual sense in terms of like we have different giftings, but also in an overall timeline sense. We stand on the shoulders of these great saints who have gone before us and we have the testimony of King David 
We have the testimony of people like Job of Daniel to guide us. Jesus goes on in John chapter 10, verse 16. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold because his ministry is initially to the Jews, right? I must bring them also. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. See that? Jews and Gentiles in God's eyes were both sheep. But there is an order in which we come into that one flock with one shepherd. First them, then us. Now, Paul says more about order. All right. He, he talks a little bit more about it than what I've just said. He talks about it specifically in relation to the last things, meaning the end of all days. Now, so far, we've established that there's a judgment, there's a resurrection of the dead, and these things have not happened yet. I think we can say that with certainty. These are the things that are going to occur in the future. Do not be deceived by any groups who say that Christ has already come. It's nonsense. No offense to them, but it is not true. It's not biblical. You can't bear it up with God's word. It's just a fact. And if we deceive ourselves, then we miss out on great treasure and we obscure the key to knowledge, Jesus Christ. And obscuring Jesus is a very dangerous mistake for our souls. So concerning last things, Paul says something that we talked about last week, or two weeks ago, actually, sorry, Romans 8.23. Not only we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. All right? Paul's talking about how one day we're going to have new bodies. We're going to have the new life. We're going to be in heaven, as we've established for these past two weeks. One day, but not today. And he says, we all. We all. So not just them to whom it was written, but also us. And he talks about it as if it's all going to occur at one time. That though my, my, my relatives, my great-grandparents who are Christian, right, we will all be resurrected at the same time. We'll be resurrected with David. We'll be resurrected with Moses. It'll be one moment, the redemption of the bodies of the sons of God, the children of God, the firstborn, the secondborn, all of us, we will be at one time united with the Lord. In other words, how there's one people, one promise, and one overall destiny. So our final end is the same, so to speak. But there still remains that distinction of timeline, a distinction according to the flesh. That there is an Israel that is not purely spiritual. There is truth to, sorry, there is meaning to the fact that God chose the Jews as a people over the Gentiles in the beginning. Not that he, as I said, loves them more necessarily, but that he has a purpose for them. John, Romans 9, 1 to 5. Let's read this in the New International Version. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, a physical people here, the people of Israel. For theirs, to this genetic group, is the adoption to sonship. Theirs, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. Abraham's a Jew. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah. Jesus is a Jew who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So, now this isn't to say that the church is no longer a spiritual people. I mean, it remains true the church is a spiritual people and not a physical people. Paul confirms this in just a few more words. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, meaning that just because you're genetically a Jew, it doesn't mean that you are automatically going to heaven. All right? But it remains a fact that to that group, to those physical people, to those true existing descendants of Abraham that are out there in the world, God had a plan for them and for Abraham's literal descendants. Even though, as Paul goes on to say, in other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. We can't forget, of course, Paul is a Jew. Peter is a Jew. You know, all, all, all the Bible is written really by Jews. And if you find a book that's not written by one of them, it was preserved by them. It was preserved by them 100%. You just can't get around that. They have a special place, a special role. But there's a little bit more to it than that, specifically in regards to the end times, how we are one, but many. 
See, Paul, in this discussion of the physical Jews, so God still has a plan for them. He still has a plan for physical Israel, that they'll be incorporated again into spiritual Israel, i.e. the church, i.e. heaven. He sets down a salvation timeline, and he gives us some information on how Israel is the firstborn, the Gentiles are the secondborn, so to speak, but he gives a little bit more than that. He says, between then, meaning when he wrote this letter and the final resurrection, there's a time of the Jews, which is the Old Testament, which results in the coming of Jesus Christ. And then there's a time of Jews and Gentiles as one Israel. This is what uh, is the present, the New Testament culminating in the return of Christ, which has not yet occurred. There's a timeline of events. So from the beginning of the world until Jesus is a special time for the Jews. They had the revelation, they had God's promise, they were unique on the face of the earth. And again today, from Paul's day to now, Christians are unique. They have God's promise, they're unique on the face of the earth. They have the Bible, other people don't have the Bible. And there is a connection, a geographical reality to the spread of the gospel. There always has been, and there always will be. All right, but within that, there is a timeline. First, Christ is rejected by the Jews. That's already happened. That was during his earthly ministry. And then a result of it is a reception of him by the Gentiles. And then there is a great reception of him by the Jews. Then the end, the return of Christ. Where do we find this? We'll find it in Romans 11. It's a bit of a long chunk. We're going to start in verse 7. We're going to read this timeline. We're going to see how there is a reception of Christ by the Gentiles, which is very much the present time. But then there will come in the future a great reception of Jesus by the Jews. There will be a revival, a Christian revival among the Jewish people. And I say then the end, but really between a reception of him by the Gentiles and a great reception of him by the Jews, I mean, it hasn't occurred. It's been 2,000 years at least, or close to 2,000 years, I guess, to be precise. So let's, let's read how Paul talks about this, how he unfolds it. I think... Uh, it'll be straightforward. If we bear everything I've been talking about in mind, I hope this, this reading will make perfect sense. I won't really have to explain that much. Paul is very straightforward, I think. Romans 11, uh, verse 7 is where we're beginning. What then? What the people of Israel sought to earnestly, what sought so earnestly they did not obtain, the elect among them did, but the others were hardened, speaking of the physical Jews and the spiritual Jews among them, specifically the ministry of Christ to the present, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. Paul is quoting Isaiah 29.10, Deuteronomy 29.4. He goes on to say, And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Psalm 69.22-23. Alright, so in other words... Following the ministry of Jesus, there isn't a large majority of Jews that are Christians. That's, that's essentially what he's talking about. That's what the spirit of stupor is. That's what that is. I hope that's clear. Verse 11. Again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for their world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles... How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Meaning, how amazing will it be if the Jews become Christians? All of them. All of them. Full inclusion. All of them. How amazing will it be, says Paul. How fantastic it will be if they all become saved. Because through their rejection of Jesus, Jesus went to the Gentiles. The gospel moved to the Gentiles. And how great was that? For the world. What a great benefit it was, the spreading of Christ among the nations. So what an even greater benefit it will be. In other words, if 12 apostles could start so much in 120 in the upper room, if those Jews could start such a worldwide movement, that small number, what if all the Jews were in this worldwide movement of Christianity? That's, that's what Paul is speaking about. And I, I hope, again, that is clear. But I would also like to point something out before we move on, and this is maybe some of the trouble people have with reading Paul, is notice how he's talking about whole nations and people groups as one entity. All right, He speaks about Israel here, making Israel envious, and he speaks about their full inclusion 
But obviously, not every Jew who's ever been born can be included in that, right? Because many have died outside of Christ. The, there are one, but there are many. And what he is speaking of is there will come a time where all those who are of Israel, who are to be saved, will be saved. He's going to make this clear uh, later on. But I just want to point out this way he talks and the way he writes, where he speaks of whole nations over spans of thousands of years as one entity. Right? He talks about salvation having come to the Gentiles. He's not saying all the Gentiles have been saved. Not, not by a long shot. But he speaks about us as if we are one generation. As if all humanity is one people. One man to be born into this world, so to speak, in a metaphorical, maybe not fully metaphorical, metaphorical sense. Let's continue. Verse 13. I am talking to you Gentiles... Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? It goes on. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. In other words, all of them, all the Jewish people are holy before God, set apart for him. Verse 17, if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those branches. Notice here now he switches from talking about everybody as a group to now talking about individuals. How there are many branches, so-called Jewish branches, grafted into the Messiah, into Jesus Christ, grafted into that tree, right? That's salvation. Those that rejected Jesus were broken off, those individuals. And in their place, others were added, the Gentiles, you and me. Speaking as individual branches that have been added to the tree. He says, do not consider yourself, verse 18, to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. What does it mean? You can have the promise. You can have the plan of God destined for you. But that doesn't mean as an individual you will claim it. Unless you have faith. That's a pretty powerful statement by Paul. And it's a definitive. There's no way around it. To me, this is very clear. He's warning. You can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation because you stand by faith. So don't be prideful. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Verse 22. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Now, here, I don't think Paul is necessarily speaking of, like, the same group of people. Well, he could be, right? But he's speaking of it really in a, as a general statement, meaning that as so long as anyone, whether Jew or Gentile, so to speak, is not consistently unbelieving but submits to God, they will be added back in. Right? That's the ministry. You can lose it, but you can also get it. You can receive again the promise. Specifically in Paul's case, he's talking about the Jews, and he established earlier, as you as you saw, that to them belongs the adoption of sonship, the covenants, the patriarchs. To the Jews belongs these things, but by and large, Jews do not believe in Jesus. That he's saying if they do not persist in their unbelief, they will be restored to their position. Continuing on, verse 24. After all, if you were cut out, of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? And I, I think this is a, an absolute truth in so many ways, especially in biblical studies. Uh, when I study God's Word, you're so aware that you're entering into a, a, a culture that is not your natural culture, a language that's not your natural language. There's a great advantage to the Jews who know Hebrew to reading the Old Testament, right? There's a, there's a great advantage to that. So that's in part, I think, what he's talking about, but moving on. 
Verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Here's a mystery. Brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written. Let's pause here and let's just focus right here. Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant of the mystery. What is the mystery? That right now the Jews maybe have a hard heart toward Jesus, but there come, will come a point when the quote-unquote full number, but more accurately translated the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there's some point where the Spirit's going to move and he's going to bring revival among the Jewish people. He's going to save them. All right, That hasn't happened yet. It just hasn't. And there will reach a point, we'll continue along. Many Gentiles will be saved. There's a great harvest, millions of Christians being saved across the world, whether it's in China, in India, in Africa, even in North America, growth rates have slowed, but still tons of people come in to the church daily in large numbers. Soon, there will reach a point where large numbers of Jews will be saved. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, meaning not the physical Israel anymore, but the spiritual Israel. All the church, all the people of God, all those whom the Lord is patiently waiting to come to repentance will be saved. All right, now that's important to recognize. But I also want to add something here, and I hope this isn't misunderstood. In no way, in what I'm saying, am I denigrating the Jewish people or anything like that. And this is actually directly what Paul is addressing, anti-Semitism. A racism that these Gentiles saw themselves as better than the Jews, superior to them. I have Jesus and you've rejected him. I'm better than you. Paul is saying, do not think like that. Don't think you are better than them. You're not, for we're all on one tree. Furthermore, you stand on their shoulders in the timeline. So be humble, humble and kind and patient and so as believers, I think what he is saying, and I don't think you can get around it, the Lord wants us to be extra kind to Jewish people wherever we find them, wherever we see them, wherever we meet them. That's what he wants for us to do, just as he wants us to be kind to fellow Christians. Let's continue on. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This hasn't yet occurred. Isaiah 59, 20 to 21. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 24. And also he's quoting Isaiah 27, 9 in the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament version. He's quoting that as well. So notice that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. And it's in the Old Testament. And now it's confirmed in the New Testament. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved. On account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Now, I want to pause here again. I'll just throw out a little random nugget of information that I've noticed. Um, I think very often it's pointed out that, well, Luke and Acts are to be viewed as one collection. And we always point to the strong association of Luke and Paul, right? So we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and we see, think, well, John should be maybe b before Luke so that we get all this kind of quote-unquote Pauline stuff together in one because Luke and Paul are very similar in their thinking. What's actually interesting and what I've noticed, and this just vindicates the Bible even more, is Paul is, is way more similar to John. You'll notice I quote from John's gospel a lot. It's because Paul and John are like, they're very, very close in the way they talk about salvation and everything like that. And this is actually a good example. In John's gospel, it is the Jews that are, quote unquote, the enemies. That shows up very strongly, right? Now, it's not the Jews as in like, you know, all the Jews, but the Jews as in those who are opposed to Jesus. Now, and I just should address it. It has been used at times in the church, misconstrued that the church should denigrate Jewish people because they're enemies of Christ. That's just ridiculous. Anyone who thinks that hasn't read the Bible clearly. It's very clear that what Paul is saying even here, he's not saying that they are enemies in the sense that you shouldn't like them. But the fact that they're enemies is of benefit to you. Why? Judas is a Jew. The Pharisees, the crowd, those who helped crucify Christ were Jews. 
And God did this according to his predetermined plan, according to his foreknowledge, for the sake of all the church. Right? Is the role they played at that time. God had mercy on them. Jesus forgave them. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They didn't have the knowledge. In a sense, he held them innocent of the blood of God. Think about that. He doesn't see them as responsible for that. So it is ludicrous for Christians to blame Jews or to denigrate Jews for anything. It's just, it's just nonsense. So I just, I just want to address that directly. We cannot be anti-Semitic in any way. Uh, in fact, the Bible cl- clearly here speaks that anti-Semitism is a pathway to losing salvation. Being negative towards Jewish people in a thinking is a pathway to drifting away from God and potentially being broken off from the olive tree of salvation. That's, that's what Paul says here. So just something to note. And I think we, not to go always to this place, but you can see this clearly in Hitler, who becomes anti-Semitic, and he's from a primarily Christian nation. It's primarily Lutheran Germany, especially at the time period. There's churches everywhere, right? And then how far from God did they go? How deep is the pit of hell for some of those people? Just to put it plainly. You know, and that's the danger of hardening your heart towards the Jewish people. Don't do that. It's very dangerous. Anyways, continuing on, verse 30. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This verse of mine. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. I quote it normally in the New American Standard Bible. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Is actually not a random throwaway verse, though maybe it seems this way, and we look at it, what does this mean? I hope people have been wondering, what exactly does this verse mean? Well, it's not really any different from this verse. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, God let sin reign. God let the devil have control. God let people be sinners. Why? So that they could realize their guilt and their shame and come to know salvation. So that by playing in the world and seeing the pleasures and follies of sin, you would say with the writers of Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It is no accident, I think, that a very large number of people come to Christ older in their years. People who grew up in church, you know, you, you, you come to Christ later in life. You become very serious in your faith later in life. Why? Because you realize the futility of this world without Jesus. That's really what it goes down to. And there's, that's just the, the long and short of it. So this is really saying the same thing as that. God has let sin flourish so that he may forgive everyone. And really that, these two verses that I've quoted here, are no different from these. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Speaking to the Jews who had been exiled to Babylon for their sins. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. What is it saying? Notice how this you, this you that will be brought back is not individuals, but a group. A group of people. When God says here in Jeremiah that he has plans to prosper you. The generation that receives this promise won't live to see it. They won't live to see it because it says what? Verse 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you. But I'm dead. (laughs) 70 years, I'm gone. Right? So how is it fulfilled to you? Well, it's fulfilled to me as one, as sorry, as part of the many that make up the one. It's fulfilled to the people of Israel who are holding on to what? The promise. Those who hold on to the promise, we are considered one in God's eyes, one generation. One generation is how the Lord sees us, as one man. That's how he talks to us so often. That's how united, that's why 
Loving your neighbor is the second commandment. That's why loving your fellow Christian is so high on God's list, because we're one. How can you hate yourself? It's just nonsense. You'll destroy yourself. You can't hate other Christians. You just, you can't. You can't hate Jews. They're, they're part of salvation history. You, you just can't. Can't hate anyone because God made us all, <laughs> so, so so to speak, right? And you know this is this is the the tragedy really of of the hatred that fills people. I think it's very easy for other nations and races to look at the horrible things people have done. People criticize you know Germany and the Germans, but really, you know these sheep. What do they know what they've done? There's really a few people who know what they're doing, but I really think most people they don't really know what's going on. They don't really know what's happening, and as the scholarship has so well shown, the whole world was really anti-Jewish at that time period. It wasn't like just Germany. I mean, in Russia, there was so much anti-Semitism too. And then you have how the Turks, they went and committed genocide against the whole race, the Armenians, how they just wiped them out. Nobody really talks about that either, right? And you talk about the Romanians. People talk about how the Romanians, you have a Vlad the Impaler, the so-called inspiration for Dracula, how he went and killed so many Turks to defend his country is what people leave out. He slaughtered so many Turks because the Turks were conquering his nation and invading him, so he killed so many of them in retaliation. So, humanity has been full of so much hatred one to another, irrespective of the stock you come from. We are all, if you will, the same fundamental breed. Sinners. So, when you see world history and you see how God sees us, it's just very humbling. He sees us as one person. Yet he still redeems us despite how wicked we are, how much we hurt one another. He still loves us and lavishes his grace on us. Anyways, continuing to this, you notice, I think, in this verse that it says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is, of course, applied to the Jewish people in large part when they uh, leave, sorry, Babylon and return to Israel. But also there's a spiritual application to it when the Jews were gathered after World War II from abroad and made the nation Israel, right? A fulfillment of Bible prophecy, very much so. And so there's a sense that this prophecy itself hasn't yet occurred, that you will call on me and come and pray to me. That has not yet fully occurred. That moment of time where the Jews fully return to Jesus and pray to him hasn't yet occurred. God will bring them back from their captivity. He will gather them from all the nations and he will bring them back to the promised land, to that covenant of Abraham, that salvation story. So we see Jeremiah, Paul, same thing. And what Paul says in many words, Jeremiah says in fewer words, and Jesus says in one verse, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So you see it's God's plan from the first to the last. That through what he was going to do with the Jewish people, he would give an example to all the world. A light to all nations. A light that could not be hidden under a bushel, but that would be shined. How the faithful testimony of Jewish Christians or the Jews original, however you want to say it, who followed God, shines today. How the story of David, the story of Abraham, how those little lights shine. David wasn't the king of a mighty kingdom. It was a very small nation, especially by global standards. But that little light shone. Jeremiah was just a prophet to who knows how many people. He was in the court of a king, but a small-time king. Not a giant nation. He wasn't a great scientist. But how that little light shone. Even Daniel, the nation of Babylon, mighty though it was, was a small part of the world. And his role, not as massive, relative to all of history. But yet that little light shines. See how God loves to use sheep to bless the other sheep. How he loves to let them hear his voice be united together as one flock. So you see here Jesus' statement is a statement of salvation history. There are other sheep which are not yet of the fold. There's other people who haven't yet been saved. Jesus will bring them in. They'll hear his voice. And one day, one day, they will be one flock with one shepherd. Those who have yet to be born will be born and will come into the church. And one day, with our new bodies, we'll see him and we'll really be under that one 
shepherd and he will lead us. Because on earth, though Christ leads us, not as if he was our full shepherd. I want to be careful with what I say here. Not meaning that Jesus doesn't lead us today, but how great it will be when he leads us in heaven, when we are by the still waters, in the green pastures, after we've walked through that valley of the shadow of death, when he's anointing us with oil, when he's rejoicing with us, when gladness and goodness pursue us instead of our enemies and our troubles and our trials and our tribulations, when the accuser, when the devil is silent and there's peace. The great plan of salvation history shows how God uses evil, turns it to good, how he uses unfaithfulness as a means to demonstrate his faithfulness, how he even uses the most wicked of sins to bring about the greatest grace, the crucifixion of Christ, how even in that he is merciful. Really, Paul demonstrates for us the heart of God, how his mind is beyond understanding, this plan, how we are all free, yet he is sovereign in control that we can have peace, that so many mysteries are within this book. That just And they're just opened up if you just stick a few verses together. Let's read on. Back to Romans 11. Let's finish the chapter. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and inscrutable his ways or his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Any questions? That's where we are. Oh, there's no one here but me. So I guess we have no questions. I'm sorry that this Bible study took a long time. It was a while to put together. Um, we'll talk more about uh, the one moment, I think is where I would like to go to next in theory. Next week, I'd like to talk about uh, that, the last trumpet, <laughs> as it is so often called in church, or in songs and in hymns and things like that. But we'll see how we get there. I want to get there kind of methodically and slowly. I want us to take our time and see how well the Bible fits together, how verses, and I love to use verses that we all know and are popular, because there's such a depth to God's Word, you know, it can be used so many ways to encourage, to strengthen, and also to reveal his plans and his mind, right? That Jeremiah verse, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I'm sure many of us know it. But how many of us have connected to it, have connected it to salvation history, to the return of Jesus Christ? You see how everything in the Bible connects to that moment, how everything is about Jesus, how to him belongs all things, how this world is his. Well, at this point, I'll just plug the Thursday Bible study. I hope you guys get a chance to see the next Bible study video on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be releasing it on Friday. I'm a day behind, but it'll be really good. It'll be connected somewhat to this topic. There's a bit of synchronism there, so hopefully it makes sense. This is it for me. If anyone, you know, emails a question, I, this is what, if you email me a question, I will take it up in the next Bible study. If it's any question of any kind, just send it my way, email a question to me, and I will I will answer it. As long as it's not like deeply personal or anything like that. But well, maybe I can't answer it too. Maybe you stump me. In which case I'll just apologize. But anyways, that's it for me, friends. I look forward to seeing you all. When I see you, stay strong in these COVID times. Be safe. And have a great week.